Um, I thought I would start by talking a bit about the process and also what um, we were looking for in terms of a, a new CEO. So first of all, as to the process, uh, we retained a group of international consultants because we, we did a worldwide search for this position. We had uh, 85 candidates and formed a board subcommittee that uh, narrowed this down to six, and we interviewed six uh, people for the position before uh, determining that Mark was our chosen candidate. Um, in doing this, we uh, looked at six different criteria for what we wanted uh, in the role of CEO. So those six criteria were, first of all, the successful candidate had to have a very in-depth knowledge of New Zealand, what it takes to be a Kiwi, whether it's uh, things such as our sense of humour, our multiculturalism, how we regard ourselves as practical, all of the things that make uh, us up as, uh, as New Zealanders, understanding the Pacifica, the, um, the new ethnicities that have come in, uh, iwi, uh, as well as the, the whole connection and history uh, of New Zealand. Secondly was to have a deep love of rugby. Uh, so that goes from the five-year-old girls and boys who kick a ball around or play with a ball out in the park, uh, right through to our clubs, our schools, um, communities, uh, right through to uh, semi-professional professionalism and the international game. Had to know the importance of rugby as our national sport. Uh, thirdly was around innovation. Uh, we all know, no matter what industry that we work in, that disruption is an everyday activity these days. So uh, innovation in this space uh, covers participation, the way that um, kids play the game, the way um, uh, the fans interact with the game. Um, for example, if you look at the Midic 10 Cup, um, the huge increase in social media the way that um, people are consuming our game and in, in the, in the snackable uh, content. Um, the way we can try and get fans to come along to the game, the, uh, those experiences, and there are always challenges uh, in that area. How do we um, monetize uh, using uh, some of the digital technology that we've got? Uh, another challenge, again, something that's common to so many industries. Uh, fourthly, we need to drive revenue. Um, New Zealand rugby uh, aims for a, for a break even and to put all the money that we make back into the pot. Uh, these are challenging times when it, uh, when it comes to making sure that the programs that we want to put into place um, in all sorts of spheres that we've got the money uh, to do so. So there's a commercial aspect to this as well. Um, next is around leadership and mana. Probably the mana being uh, a little bit more important because uh, that is the, the way in which we, we want to come across as an organisation. The rugby way is included in this about respect, uh, humility, uh, personal discipline and the types of things that are important to us as far as our culture is concerned. Uh, and finally, uh, connectivity. The uh, ability to be able to relate to staff, to sponsors, stakeholders, you the media, uh, our public. So that all of those criteria we took um, into, into account uh, and uh, Mark came through that progress, a process which was fairly rigorous to be appointed. So Mark's background is that he was um, born and bred in Taranaki, uh, played rugby for Taranaki, Wellington, Canterbury, Crusaders, the All Blacks obviously, uh, and Kobe uh, in Japan. He's been on our board since 2013, head of the rugby committee. He's on World Rugby, on the Exco of World Rugby, and those international connections are, are vital uh, to us. So uh, Mark is married to Nova, three kids, uh, and we welcome him from uh, 2020 as the new uh, New Zealand rugby CEO. So with that, I'll thank you very much, and I'll pass over to Mark. Thanks, Brent. Um, kia ora koutou, everyone. Thank you for coming along. Uh, I've just got a few, I guess, opening comments and then happy to take some, some questions. So first, can I just say it's a, it's a massive honour to be appointed to this role. It's, it's obviously a very significant role within the New Zealand 
landscape and especially in the sporting context. So I'm delighted uh, and, and privileged to assume the responsibility for next year of leading this great sport of ours um, forward. Um, I, I think, uh, importantly, I have a deep drive and passion for the game, and that's primarily what motivates me to be involved in it. Uh, been involved in it from a, from a very young age and, uh, and love the game. So being in a position to be able to continue to help foster it, and grow it, and respond to some of the challenges which we face in the, in the near future with all the challenges of a, a changing world uh, that, are, that are apparent, then you know, that really spins my wheels and I'm, I'm looking forward to being involved with that with a great team that we've had assembled here under Steve's leadership. And, and I, I guess at this time it's important to acknowledge Steve and thank him. I, I think Steve's done an amazing job in the last um, 12 years, been a fantastic leader of this organisation and is renowned you know, all over the world wherever we go with rugby. Uh, with a huge amount of mana, and, and I, particularly on a personal note, want to thank him for, for what he's done in the last couple of days since I've been appointed and reaching out and ensuring that this transition will be the best one possible for, for the organisation and, and therefore for the sport in this country. Um, you know, I guess that's the mark of the guy that it's, it's all about this organisation that's important to him, and, uh, and I think that's a true, true test of character when, when parting he wants to leave that legacy in, intact. Well, I guess we're going to have a few questions sooner or later about you know, priorities and, and what I'm focused on and, and what the organisation's focused on. And those really come back to uh, some of the things that Brent outlined in his introduction. So we know we've got challenges in the community game and, and uh, our broader engagement uh, of rugby in our, in our country. So we've got, to, we've got to work hard in those areas. Revenue is, you know, is a significant opportunity there, but there's a challenge. We've got players, obviously... Um, departing our shores more regularly than we'd like, and there's um, you know constant pressure from the overseas market around that. And as revenue is going to be important in that context, but as well as continue to foster the game at the community level, um, it's going to be important that we get more innovative and move a little more quickly in terms of trying to raise that revenue quickly. Uh, future competitions, I guess you know that's that's prevalent at the moment with. Um, future broadcast negotiations and things like that. You know, we're well across looking at different opportunities in the in the competition space, and I think the advent and growth of um, you know respect and responsibility and inclusion framework in recent years has been has been another fantastic achievement. It's something we'll look to continue to grow to ensure that the game projects well and as accessible as possible to to all New Zealanders. And finally, it's obviously critical that our, our national teams and our teams in black. Uh, are performing at the highest possible standard to be able to support them and resource them well is absolutely critical to our future also. So I guess in summing all that up, the challenge I suppose is to be able to preserve everything that's great about our game, uh, all, the, all the traditions and legacy that you know, I'm very familiar with, um, with the fact that we have to you know, become a little more innovative, a little more nimble and respond very quickly to a world that's changing very, very quickly on us, not only domestically with the people that we work with and our, our young people and the way people engage with the sport, but the way uh, in which you know, the world is looking at us and increasingly um, you know, wanting to source our talent and, and make it more and more difficult for us on the international stage. So uh, I think I'll leave, leave it there in terms of opening comments and, and look forward to some questions for Brent and I. Brent, uh, just going back to your first point about uh, wanting someone who knows New Zealand uh, so well, I assume you had overseas candidates, but did that essentially rule those people out? Uh, in a simple word, yes. Um, we Of the 85 candidates, uh, there were a number, um, estimates somewhere between 15 and 20 from uh, overseas organisations, combination of professional sporting background, uh, business background, um, and uh, our criteria really cut that cut that back. So, of the final six on the shortlist, uh, all were New Zealanders. And Mark, uh, congratulations. Um, Thank you. How would you compare yourself to Steve? Obviously, we've had a bit to do with Steve over the last few years, been in the role for a while. This will probably be a bit of a change. Um, are you a different type of leader to him? Do you think, or how do you differ to him? Uh, well, I guess firstly, it's probably important to just acknowledge that. You know, we've known each other a while, Steve and I, and we've worked together closely, especially in the last five or six years with World Rugby. So what I would say as a start is we're, uh, things we do share is a huge passion for the game here and a, you know, a real love of the game and a, and a, 
I guess, a, a real drive to want to make sure that the game's looked after in this part of the world. But, you know, recognise the fact we're different people, we're from different, you know, upbringings and, and different environments, and growing up, experiencing different things, so there will be there will be differences. It's probably not for me to comment right now on exactly what they are. Probably other people might have more of an idea on that, to be honest, as I grow into the role. But, um, you know, there, there'll be differences, um, but certainly have a huge amount of respect for them. Mm -hmm. Brian, what makes Mark's skill set, background, experience um, suitable for what New Zealand rugby needs right now? The question was, what makes it doable for New Zealand no, rugby? Mark, Mark's experience is um, appropriate, sorry, for what New Zealand rugby needs right now. Okay, well first of all, if you go through my criteria that I listed before, uh, Mark knows New Zealand very, very well. He's lived in both North Island, South Island, all over, played for various rugby teams, um, children brought up here, families known here. He's clearly got a deep love for New Zealand. Um, Mark um, uh, knows the innovation area. Uh, he was uh, educated at Cambridge University. Um, so when questioning him uh, up on, on both the commercial side of innovation and the, um, the game side of it. Um, as, as well as that, um, we believe he brings the necessary leadership, um, ability to connect with stakeholders and sponsors. He's got, got that as well. Um, and um, he comes from a commercial background. He stepped out of rugby for some time, ran um, uh, a reasonably substantial business in Taranaki. So uh, to us, he ticked a lot of boxes. Now, the, the, no candidate uh, in, a, in a process like this um, is perfect. You have to go through and you weigh up. In this particular um, process, we didn't actually apply a weighting to any of the six. We took the six in and we um, worked it um, so that all were uh, equally important. Um, but we felt that um, Mark ticked uh, all of those boxes. Mark, how would you sort of describe the state of the grassroots game club rugby in that stage? Oh, as I said in my introduction, there's certainly challenges in, in uh, that area of the game. Um, you know, I think we're responding quite quickly to, with some of the initiatives that the participation plan have you know, initiated in the last sort of six months or so. And as I said now, the challenge is to move quite quickly. Uh, so creating you know, different formats of the game that make the game more accessible, not being so rigid around you know, sets of rules, numbers of players that have to be on a field. I guess making the, the game... Um, as open and accessible as possible seems to be, you know, critical to, to our future in that space. Um, I think the game's in a reasonable heart from the age of sort of five to ten year olds, ten or eleven. We've certainly got um, great support base there around coaches and volunteers. Um, we do start to have some challenges when the game becomes a more contact sport, and we're working hard around safety initiatives to try and uh, make sure that we can, um, you know, minimise the the ability for people to access the game at that stage. And that's when I come back to the comments around you know, formats of the game that we've got to work hard for. If you keep working through the, I guess, the rugby pathway, the, the secondary school space, we've done a lot of work on in the last six months or so with the secondary school review that was launched at the back end of last year. So a new governance structure starting to be developed there. And, and again, that's a key focus in terms of areas of looking for new formats of the game. So do we have to play, you know, on Saturday morning and afternoon every week? Do we have to practice on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you know, can we do more at lunch times, can we make the game um, more accessible at different stages? And that, and that, I guess, off that spins a whole lot of questions around access to infrastructure and fields um, and making sure that we've got people around the, the sport that can make that work, but there are certainly questions that we're starting to ask you know, very seriously. Um, so overall we've got challenges, but I think we've started to you know, shift, shift the dial a little bit in terms of acknowledging that, and now, as I said earlier, we've got to move really quickly to to make sure that that, that takes uh, hold in the, in the communities and provinces and our clubs understand it and um, hopefully we can sort of grow a new era of, era of participation in that area. Yeah, this, um, this is a role that you've aspired to have for quite some time on a personal note. Oh, it's certainly a role that, um, you know, excites me and, and I've been uh, someone, I guess, occasionally you do, you know, let yourself think about these sorts of things, but uh, it's not something I've been, you know, constantly driven by or or constantly been thinking about. Um, certainly, you know, it was a surprise when um, Steve's, um, Steve made his announcement earlier in the year. And uh, from that time on, we, you know, we talked about it as a family um, a lot uh, and then ultimately made the decision to, to apply. So, um, yeah, I'm thrilled. It's, it's certainly a, a dream job. It's something that, you know, uh, 
I'm going to put a huge amount of energy into and give my absolute best to. Off the back of Duncan's question, and I suppose at the other end of the scale, but how would you see the state of professional rugby globally? And from a New Zealand point of view, what's the biggest challenge in that department? Well, there's a number of things going on in that space, if you've probably followed. Um, you know, it, it was a real shame that the um, Nations Championship competition couldn't get you know across the line. Um, we Certainly in this part of the world, we were huge supporters of, of that. And uh, we think that would have done an awful lot for Tier 2 competitions, our, uh, you know, our friends in the Pacific and other Tier 2 nations around the world as well. Um, now we have to, again, be, be adapt quickly and be flexible around what future competitions we look for for our professional players to be involved in. Um, there, there's opportunities there. There's certainly, I guess... You know, we're looking at major markets of the world and their ability and their appetite to be part of our competitions or and involved in different ways. We, we think there's great opportunity to, to do things in that space. Uh, but in, in the short term, it's going to mean that we, I guess, work really hard to retain the talent that we can, keep developing them, keep the best possible coaches here so that we, you know, we've got great environments for players. It's not always all about money. Um, it's about, about opportunity for our young players, and that's why we've got to make sure, our, as I said earlier, our environments are... Are great, um, but yeah, I, I think there's a lot there's a lot to happen in the space at the moment. Obviously, with the intervention of private equity overseas in some uh, some parts of the world, we need we need to think carefully around the way we approach uh, that in the future and and uh, the professional game as a whole. And it's going to throw up a lot of challenges that we need to work through really quickly. Mark, just like the challenges of youth, right, and the grassroots, uh, how quickly would you like to turn the wheel? Well, you know, as I say, some of, some of the um, changes at, at youth at younger level is going to be initiated as soon as next year with some different trials and that sort of thing. So, um, I, you know, I haven't got a finite time until you see these things hit, I guess, hit the ground and start. we start working with communities in our provinces and get some feedback on what these new formats might look like. We'll know better then, I guess, but as soon as possible. You know, we know we've got some issues around participation, participation, partic particularly at the secondary school area, sorry. And so um, that's the area we'd like to move especially quickly in. Mm. Um, as a former player, player who's played at a high level, what role do you think that can play for you? Well, I guess it gives you some insights. You know, I've certainly um, got an appreciation of, of playing the game at all, all levels. And, um, you know, that, that helps. It helps you see certain situations through a certain lens, which can be helpful. But to be honest, this... This role is so broad and vast with such complexity that you're going to have to rely on a little bit more than just being a former player to be able to, you know, work through challenges. So, um, so yeah, it's got a part to play, but it's, it's certainly not something I'll be relying on solely, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think we, we have been for some time. You know, we know uh, the economics around the world don't, don't favour us in this space, so... Um, you know, and we're doing work behind the scenes with you know commercial modelling on different projects to see what we can do to to um, you know assist in that area. Um, so yeah, the question is absolutely we have to work incredibly quickly. But that's something that's been happening for some time now. In fact, you know probably the last ten or fifteen years to be honest. But it's certainly gathered momentum in the last four or five. It feels like. Do you feel like that with a few of the issues? Like you kind of come into this job and you might have to press go on them pretty quick, or they're too complex to to really. Oh, look, we've got, a, we've got a fantastic base to work from. There's no, no question, you know. We, we hold four World Cups, um, you know, across both forms of the game in sevens and, and fifteens. Our brands are, and competitions are internationally recognised. There's, there's not, it's not a doomsday sort of situation we're in. We just need to recognise that we've got some challenges that uh, we need to, you know, work especially quickly on. So, uh, you know, I'm delighted with the base we've got to work from. As I said, some of the... Some of the um, achievements we have there and the team of people we have around us. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited by that and, and not daunted by it. It's just we're going to have to get moving quickly and, and uh, get into our work. Just back to the uh, other candidates. I've got some pretty impressive people in this organisation. Was it hotly contested amongst people inside New Zealand? Right? We, had, uh, we had both internal and uh, external candidates. Um, the answer is yes, it, it was uh, hotly contested. Um, the external applicants also, uh, we had some uh, high-caliber uh, individuals uh, apply. 
Um, so uh, in terms of in, in terms of talent, we couldn't have asked for better uh, to give us um, a range to to choose from. Mark, it's also been a lot happening in the women's space, especially the last couple of years. In the women's rugby. Yes. Um, how much more do you think there is to be done in that space? Oh, there's, there's huge opportunities. Obviously, the growth there, as you just said, has, has been one of um, a real highlight for the organisation in the last couple of years. So how we continue to provide the, the right environments for that, the game to flourish at all levels, you know, we, uh, at a very junior level, the opportunity to create maybe women's, uh, sorry, girls rugby, you know, competitions so they're not competing with, with boys at an age where it compromises their involvement. That's, that's one thing. The secondary school space, again, there's, there's different challenges there that we... We have to work through that our team team is on to. And in terms of the, I guess the, um, what has historically been first class level, which has largely been amateur, we're you know very keen to try and progress some form of semi-professional league in, in time. Um, and we've got some ideas around how that might might manifest, but it's it's too early to say exactly when that might happen. I think the key thing is amongst all this is winning the Women's Rugby World Cup from, uh, sorry, it's just Rugby World Cup 2021 20, now to be held in New Zealand. I, is, is decreed by World Rugby recently is a fantastic opportunity to um, leverage the game you know, in a major way in, in our biggest market here in Auckland, obviously north um, to Whangarei, which will be huge for the country, I think, and will and will really start to um, ensure that in the subconscious of New Zealanders, women's rugby is is a is a fantastic sport in its own right, and I think that'll inspire a whole new generation of young girls to want to get involved in the game and, uh, and position us really nicely for the future. Mark, you talked about helping out the sort of tier two nations and obviously the ones connected to New Zealand, the Pacific Islands. Um, are you looking to help them out more so than maybe that's going on now? Like I said, would that be quite an immediate goal for you? Well, I think you know, we have to, we have partners in world rugby that you know, we have to work closely in that sort of space with, obviously. Um, noting we can do things independently of that, but in terms of the major things that seem to be affecting the unions in the Pacific the most at the moment relate to accessing the best of their talent um, and playing in the best possible competitions possible. And and we could do better on both counts there. So, yeah, they will be conversations that we'll look to continue to have. And that, those com conversations have been ongoing for some time also. But I think we saw on, on Saturday that, you know, it's, it's concerning for the international game to have fixtures like that when we know that Tonga has so much more to offer and, and so do the other Pacific Islands to offer the international game and how much vibrancy they add to our game and how critical if world rugby wants to tr be a truly global game then then we need all of those tier two unions to be as competitive as possible and to be able to grow other tier two unions so that we have you know in time more teams competing at a world cup which truly projected into that global space. It's one of the matches as well as tournaments will be a big go for you guys. Uh, like I say, you know, around what we can do domestically on our own, we'll have to. We've got a whole lot of things around our own, our own commitments and, and calendars and player welfare and all that sort of thing that we have to weigh up with that. But yeah, it'd be nice to do more.